For several years now, there has been incredible turmoil in the Middle East. It makes you wonder whether there is any time soon where the Jews and the Palestinians will not be at each other's throats. The title of our study for today is Israel and the Palestinians. What does the Bible have to say about the role of Israel in Bible prophecy? I'd like to begin our study by going to the book of Acts, chapter 6 and verse 7. And as you're looking for that text, Acts 6, 7, I'd like to say that after the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost, the Christian movement experienced phenomenal explosive growth. A multitude of clergy and laity were joining the new Christian movement, which, by the way, was called the Way. Now let's read Acts chapter 6 and verse 7, which describes this phenomenal growth after the day of Pentecost. It says there, And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Notice the terminology, increased, multiplied, greatly. And then it says, a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Obviously, after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, there were tremendous conversions, not only in degree, but also in quantity. The book of Acts makes it very clear that one of the reasons for this phenomenal growth of Christianity is because of a Christian leader whose name is known by all of us, Stephen. Let's notice the very next verse after the one that we've just read, verse 8. Immediately after speaking about this phenomenal growth through the power of the Holy Spirit, it says, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. And so you have this new Christian movement growing phenomenally among the laity and among the clergy. Thousands and thousands of Jews are joining this Christian movement which was called the Way. This phenomenal growth led the Jewish governing council to be deeply concerned. Among the council members, by the way, there were 70 of them in the Sanhedrin. Among them was found a young man called Saul of Tarsus. He was Judaism's most promising prospect with a brilliant future ahead of him in Judaism. The Bible tells us that he was no intellectual lightweight. He was a genius. He was a Hebrew scholar. Actually, we can read Saul of Tarsus' own words when he testified later on in his life before the Jews in Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 22 and verse 3, we find these words at his defense. He says this, I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel. By the way, Gamaliel was like to say the, one of the greatest theologians of the time. And then he continues saying, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God, as ye all are this day. We find this young man, Saul of Tarsus, energetic, intelligent, zealous, and relentless. Saul of Tarsus had what we might call tunnel vision. He believed that God had chosen the Jewish nation irrevocably and unconditionally. And therefore, this competitive movement, the Christian movement, the way, must be extirpated. 
He had an admirable singleness of purpose. That purpose was to uproot the way which was competing with the Jewish nation. Saul's hatred for the Christian movement can be discerned in the attitude that he had towards Stephen. In fact, we are told in the book of Acts that Saul of Tarsus was not an innocent bystander in the stoning of Stephen. He was actually an active participant. The Apostle Paul, who at this time was called Saul, actually describes his attitude when Stephen was being martyred. In Acts chapter 22 and verse 20, we find him describing his attitude as this man of God was being stoned. He says this, And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. In other words, those who were slaying him, uh, uh, Saul of Tarsus kept the clothing at his feet while he encouraged them to kill this man. After Stephen was stoned, Saul of Tarsus undertook a crusade against the way. It was his objective to stamp out the movement that was growing like grass fire and threatening the very existence of Judaism. In fact, we're told in Acts chapter 9 and verse 2 uh, how Saul of Tarsus persecuted the Christian movement after the stoning of Stephen. It says there in Acts chapter 9 and verse 2, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Notice the terminology, breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. You see, Saul of Tarsus hated the growing Christian movement because he felt that if this movement grew, it would result in the uprooting of Judaism. But God had chosen Judaism irrevocably and unconditionally and so he made up his mind that he was going to destroy this budding movement. But not only did Saul of Tarsus hate the Christians, he also hated Jesus Christ with a passion. Later on in his life, as he's reminiscing about his early experiences, we find his description of his attitude towards Jesus. Acts 26 and verses 9 through 11. Acts chapter 26 and verses 9 through 11. Saul of Tarsus describes how he felt back then. He says this, I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them, and I punished them oft in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme, to blaspheme the name of Jesus, that is, and compelled them to blaspheme, and being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. Now the reason why Saul of Tarsus hated Christians and hated Jesus so much is because he feared that because multitudes were joining this movement, both from the laity and from the clergy, this movement was going to take the place of Judaism. In fact, the concern of Saul of Tarsus was the same concern that the Jewish leaders had when they made their decision to put Jesus to death. 
In John chapter 11 and verses 47 and 48, after Jesus resurrected Lazarus, we find that the Jewish council gathers together and they say, we have to destroy this man. And I want you to notice the reason why they felt that they needed to destroy Jesus. John chapter 11 and verses 47 and 48. It says there, Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council, and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let thus alone, let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and our nation. You see, the growth of Christianity led the Jews both in the days of Saul of Tarsus and in the days of Christ to want to extirpate this movement because they were afraid, as it says here, that the Romans would come away and take away their place and their nation because everyone would be joining this new movement and following Jesus Christ. So Saul undertook a crusade to the city of Damascus, where he had heard that there were many Christians who had adopted the new faith. If you look at a map of uh, the Holy Land, you will see that uh, he left Jerusalem and traveled north. Then he crossed the southern end of Lebanon and approached the city of Damascus from the west. Actually, uh, a few years ago, I had the privilege of vis visiting the place where it is believed that Saul has had his encounter with Jesus Christ. There's actually a monastery now uh, in that place, but it was very interesting to see a portion of the old Roman road where the Apostle Paul would have traveled to the city of Damascus. He was intent on destroying any Christian that he could find in the city. But as he was traveling to Damascus, as he was on the outskirts of the city, suddenly he saw a brilliant light in heaven and a voice that spoke to him. You see, he met on the road to, to Damascus Jesus Christ face to face. The person that he had learned to despise and to hate, the person that he had led people to blaspheme, now confronted him on the road. This encounter radically changed the life and the theology of the Apostle Paul. You see, before this, Saul of Tarsus was Israel-centered in his interpretation of prophecy. But after encountering Jesus, he now becomes Christ-centered in his interpretation of Bible prophecy. Let's read the description of Saul's experience on the road to Damascus as it is provided by Luke, the writer of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 9 and verses 3 through 6. Acts chapter 9 and verses 3 to 6. It says, And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, who thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. In other words, at this point he was, he was kicking against his conscience. In fact, when he saw the stoning of Stephen, he was very profoundly impacted by the serenity and the calm of Stephen as the people were throwing the stones. He knew that there was something special in Stephen that he needed and he wanted. But the moment that his conscience started bothering him and saying, this man is of God, he picked up and he decided that he would go on a crusade to Damascus to quiet his conscience because his old sinful heart was rebelling against the light that God was providing him with. And so on the road to Damascus, he meets Jesus Christ, whom he had hated so much. 
And the Bible says in the book of Acts that he was left blind. And do you know, actually, his physical blindness was an indication of the blindness, the spiritual blindness that he had before he received Jesus Christ. You see, we have other experiences in the Bible where physical blindness is really an illustration of spiritual blindness. He had been blind. He had been blindly persecuting Christians and persecuting Jesus Christ in the person of the Christians. He had blindly done this, but now he's left physically blind and he's told to go to the house of Judas where Ananias is going to meet him to return his sight to him. And that's exactly what happened. Saul of Tarsus went to this home. By the way, we had the privilege also of going to the place where it is believed that uh, Saul of Tarsus received his sight once again. He went there and Ananias placed his hands upon Saul of Tarsus and his eyesight was returned to him. Notice that when he receives Jesus Christ, his blindness is now turned into sight. And God has chosen now Saul of Tarsus, this champion of the Jews, of the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised the eighth day with reference to the law, blameless. God has now chosen him not to lead to the growth of Judaism, but to lead to the growth of the new Christian movement. In fact, to reach out to the Jews and to the Gentile to turn them from blindness unto light. In fact, notice in Acts chapter 26, and verse 18, the words that Jesus speaks about the mission that now Saul of Tarsus had. It says there in Acts 26 and verse 18, to open their what? See, there is the, the theme of the opening of the eyes. As he was physically blind, but then his eyesight was restored, his physical eyesight, he was actually before this spiritual, spiritually blind, and when he meets Jesus, his spiritual eyes are open. Now God says, I want you to go, not only to the Gentiles, we're going to notice, but to the Jews, and I want you to share your experience with them so that their blindness can also be turned to sight. Notice, Acts 26 and verse 18 says, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they might receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Now, some people mistakenly think that the Apostle Paul was called only to be a messenger to the Gentiles. But in fact, God called him not only to open the eyes of the Gentiles, but also to open the eyes of the Jews so that they could understand the significance of Jesus, so that they could become Christ-centered instead of Israel-centered. You say, where does the Bible say such a thing? Acts chapter 9 and verse 15. Acts chapter 9 and verse 15 says this about the mission of Saul of Tarsus. But the Lord said unto him, that is, unto Ananias, Go thy way, for he, that is Saul of Tarsus, is a chosen vessel unto me, notice this, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings, and whom else? And the children of Israel. In other words, Saul of Tarsus, who later became Paul, was not only called to minister to the Gentiles, he was also called to open the eyes of the blind Jews who had the same perspective that he had before his conversion. That is, so that they could see that the center of their faith was not the irre irrevocable decision of God to choose Israel, but the center of their faith was to be found in Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And we're told in Acts chapter 9 and verse 18 that Saul of Tarsus was baptized. Notice what it says there. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose and was what? Arose and was baptized. Who was he baptized into? What is the meaning of baptism? You know that the meaning of baptism is that when a person is immersed under the water, it says that they are baptized into Christ. 
It says in Romans chapter 6. So now, Saul of Tarsus, when he is baptized, he is incorporated into Christianity. In other words, he has changed from a focus upon literal Israel, and now he is a member of spiritual Israel. He is a member of the Christian church. And now the Apostle Paul, when he preaches the Old Testament, he doesn't find Israel at the center of the Old Testament. He finds Jesus as the center of all of the Old Testament prophecies. Notice, for example, Acts chapter 26, verses 22 and 23. Acts 26 and verses 22 and 23. Here he speaks about his new perspective. You see, before this, when he read the prophecies of the Old Testament, everything was centered in Israel. Oh, yeah, the enemies are going to come against Israel. Yeah, Yes, lo and behold, how wonderful is the temple of Israel. Oh yes, look at the sacrificial system of Israel. Everything was centered on Israel before this. But now as he looks at the Old Testament, he finds that the center of focus of the Old Testament is Jesus and only Jesus. Notice Acts 26 verses 22 and 23. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer, and that he should be first that should rise from the dead, and should show light unto the people, that is unto the Jews, and unto the Gentiles. Who was at the center of the Old Testament in the mind of Saul of Tarsus now, in the mind of Paul? It was not Israel, it was whom? It was Jesus. Jesus was the center of the Old Testament. There's a fantastic passage now that I want to read. It's an extensive passage, but it is profound where the Apostle Paul is reminiscing and remembering his experience when he used to be Jewish-centered instead of Christ-centered. We find that passage in Philippians chapter 3 and verses 3 to 10. In fact, the Apostle Paul is writing this during his first imprisonment in the city of Rome. He's writing to the Philippians. Probably there was no church that the Apostle Paul loved more than the Philippian church. You can, you can see it as you read this book, how much he loved the people from this church. Now, notice Philippians chapter 3 and verses 3 through 10. And I want you particularly to, to look at the focus... The change in focus from when he was a Jew and now when he is a Christian. It says this, For we are the circumcision, which worship God in the Spirit. What does it mean to be circumcised? It means to what? To worship God in the Spirit. Notice what he continues saying. And rejoiced in whom? In Christ Jesus. Let me ask you the question, just to stop a moment here. Um, can a person be literally, physically circumcised and be uncircumcised according to the biblical definition? Yes. According to this passage, yes or no? Yes. yes, because he says, for we are the circumcision, in other words, truly circumcised people, rejoice in whom? Worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in whom? in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. In a moment we're going to see what that means. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcise the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. What is the center of focus uh, that he's describing at this point? What was important at this point in his life? It was Judaism. It was the fact, did he have confidence in the flesh, yes or no? In fleshly circumcision? Absolutely. He said, oh, I was circumcised the eighth day. I was of the stock of Israel. 
I was of the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of the Hebrews. As touching the law, a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, I persecuted the church. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, I was blameless. That's his description of his life outside of Christ. Everything was centered in his Jewishness. Everything was centered in Israel. He thought he was a true Israelite. But now notice how he looks at the past in the light of his encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. He says, but what things were gained to me. Notice this. What things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss. In other words, all of those things that, that I trusted in, which means to have confidence in the flesh. He says, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them as dung that I may win Christ. How does he look at his Jewishness as being what? Worthless outside of Jesus. You see, being a literal Jew, being a literal Israelite, has absolutely no importance and no meaning outside of Christ. Saul of Tarsus, Paul actually says, I considered all of these things dung in the light of my relationship with Jesus now. He continues saying, And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. You see, folks, the experience of Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus was a life-changing experience for him. And by the way, he considered this so important that he tells his story twice in the book of Acts and Luke tells it another time. The story of his conversion is told three times in the book of Acts because it was a life-changing episode. You see, Saul of Tarsus, the Apostle Paul, was not now Israel-centered, but in everything he was Christ-centered. Now because of this experience, Saul of Tarsus had a total shift in his theology, in his theological way of thinking. You see, before he would say, it's literal important Israel that counts. It is the literal temple that counts. It is the literal sacrifices that count. It is the literal Shekinah in the temple that counts. In other words, everything in his mind which was important was literal, but he soon discovered that to be an Israelite did not mean to be circumcised according to the flesh, but it meant to have joined Jesus Christ. Let's notice several passages where Saul of Tarsus, the Apostle Paul now, defines what it means to be a Jew, what it means to be an Israelite. Are those who are teaching futurism and dispensationalism right in saying that the Jews who do not believe in Jesus Christ are really true Jews? Are really God's true Israel today? Not according to the definition of the Apostle Paul. Notice Romans chapter 2 verses 28 and 29. Romans chapter 2 verses 28 and 29. The Apostle Paul is categorical here. He says, for he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. What is an outward Jew? It's one who has been what? Circumcised according to the flesh. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. Let me ask you, is it possible to be circumcised physically but uncircumcised in the sight of God? Yes. And it's all defined by your relationship to whom? To Jesus. Notice what he continues saying. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the what? Of the heart. In other words, a converted heart to Jesus in the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not of men like the Jews like to receive, but of God. Notice also Romans chapter 9 and verses 6 through 8 on this same point. 
There are Jews and then there are Jews. There are physical Jews and there are spiritual Jews. And physical Jews in God's definition are not really Jews. Are you understanding me? Because Paul says he is not a Jew who is merely circumcised according to the flesh. That is not a Jew. He says a Jew is one whose heart has been what? Has been changed by the Holy Spirit. Romans 9, 6 through 8. Here the Apostle Paul says this. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect. Now notice this. For they are not all Israel which are of Israel. What? Not all Israelites are what? Are Israelites, is what he's saying. Now come on. What does he mean? That not all Israel is Israel. He means the same thing as saying that not all Jews are Jews. What is the definition of a true Jew and a true Israelite? It is one who has gone through the experience of Saul of Tarsus, who has had a conversion experience, who has received Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. That is truly the definition of a Jew. In this case, how many of the unbelieving Jews in the Middle East are truly Israel? Uh, not according to the biblical definition, none of them are. Because to be a true Jew, to be a true Israelite, means to commit your life to Jesus. He continues saying, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. Is it possible to be physically a, uh, a descendant of Abraham and not really be the seed of Abraham? According to the Paul, yes. He continues saying, that is, actually a little bit earlier, he says, neither because they are, are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. In other words, literal Jews are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Those who receive Jesus as Savior and Lord. Notice also what we find in Galatians 3, 26 to 29. You can't make this any clearer than what the Apostle Paul does here in Galatians 3, 26 to 29. He says this, For ye are all the children of God, how? Because you were born in Jerusalem. Because you have Abraham's blood. Because your last name is Goldberg or Wahlberg. No! He says, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And now notice this, and if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Who will inherit all of the promises that God made in the Old Testament to Israel? Only those who are whose? Only those who are Christ, because it says, if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed, and you will be an heir of the promises that were made to Abraham. So if you're outside of Christ, do you have a right to claim any of those promises that God made to Israel? Absolutely not. In fact, the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20, that all of the promises of God are yea and amen in Christ Jesus. No promise of the Old Testament will be fulfilled with literal Israel outside of Jesus. Unbelieving in Jesus. Notice also Colossians 3 verses 9 through 11 on the definition of what a Jew is or what a true Israelite is. Colossians 3 verses 9 through 11 the Apostle Paul says this, Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. In other words, you've been converted. The old man has been buried in the waters of baptism. And then he says, And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Now notice this, Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all.
Are you understanding that according to the Apostle Paul, there is a new Israel which is described in a Christ-centered manner? So let me ask you, where is Israel today? Where is true Israel today? Over in the Middle East? No! True Israel is where two or three are gathered in the name of Jesus, which means that Israel then is worldwide. Are you understanding my, my point? Because there are Israelites, true Israelites, that have received Jesus that are to be found where? All over the world. In other words, Israel is spiritual. Those who have joined Jesus have been converted to Jesus, and those who live all over the world. By the way, Jesus also saw this distinction between physical Israel and spiritual Israel. Notice John chapter 8, John chapter 8 and verses 37 as well as verse 44. John chapter 8, verse 37 and verse 44. You see, Jesus is speaking here to the literal Jews and they're saying, oh, well, you know, Abraham is our father and we are the children, therefore, of Abraham. Now notice verse 37, John 8, verse 37. Jesus says, I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. And then I want you to notice verse 44. The, 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 what Jesus says is going to be shocking to them. He says, I know you're the children of Abraham, but then he's going to say, you're not really the children of Abraham. Whose children were they? Notice verse 44. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. What did they want to do with Jesus at this point? They wanted to kill Jesus. Were they literal children of Abraham? Were they literal Jews? Were they physical Jews? Yes. Were they real children of Abraham? Jesus says, no. They were children of the devil because... Being a child of Abraham does not have to do with the blood you have or the last name you have or the place that you live. It has to do with which Savior you serve. That's what it means to be true Israel. So there is Israel and then there is Israel, according to Jesus. Notice also 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 20. This is a very, very interesting verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 20. Here the Apostle Paul is talking about how he can reach the Jews. Now notice, this is so interesting. We need to read the Bible carefully and slowly. Here the Apostle Paul says, And unto the Jews I became as a Jew. Does that sound strange? To the Jews I became as a Jew? What was Paul? So why would he have to become as a Jew? It must mean that he no longer considered himself what? A Jew. In the physical sense of the word. Are you understanding me or not? But he says, sometimes I kind of fit in with the culture of Judaism. Even though I was no longer a Jew, I behaved as a Jew in order to reach the Jews. Here he's saying that there are Jews and then there are Jews. Are you understanding what he's saying? To the Jews, I became as a Jew. That's like saying, if you're African-American, he says, to the African-Americans, I became as an African-American. Say, now wait a minute, you are. <laughs> what Paul is saying is that ethnicity no longer matters. What matters is our connection to Jesus Christ. Now there are several results of Paul's encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. First of all, he now understands that Israel is not physical but spiritual. He understands that Israel is not local but worldwide. Wherever two or three are gathered in the name of Jesus, there Jesus is present. You see, in the Old Testament, Jesus made himself present in the Jerusalem temple. But when he pours out the Holy Spirit, he's present everywhere where two or three are gathered together. And we're going to notice that that means that the temple is everywhere. In fact, you know, many of the dispensationalists say, uh, you know, the Apostle Paul speaks about this tree in Romans chapter 11. And he says that eventually all Israel will be saved in Romans 11 verse 26. And they say, see, all of those literal Jews in the Middle East are going to be saved. But what they forget to do is read earlier in the chapter where the Apostle Paul uses the analogy of the tree. He speaks of one tree. By the way, the tree represents God's true people. Now that tree has natural branches. 
What do the natural branches represent? They represent physical Jews who have accepted Jesus. He makes it very, very clear. But some of those branches were unbelieving. In other words, they rejected the Messiah. So what happened with those branches? They were cut off. What happened if those branches which were cut off now came to believe again? They were grafted into the tree again. But that tree also had wild olive branches. What do the wild olive branches represent? They represent the Gentiles, which were taken and grafted into the tree. Let me ask you, how many trees are there? There is one tree, which is composed of Jews and Gentiles, all of the people of God. So when the Apostle Paul says that all Israel will be saved, he means all of the literal Jews who receive Jesus and all of the Gentiles who receive Jesus Christ and are joined to him. By the way, the Apostle Paul also realized that God has only one body. You see, the dispensationalists, the futurists teach that God has radical, radically separate plans for the Jews and for the Gentiles. His plan for the Jews was suspended 2,000 years ago when the Jews rejected Christ. The prophetic clock that deals with the Jews stopped. And for 2,000 years, God has not carried on any plan for the Jews. What they say is that the time will come when the church will be raptured to heaven. And then when the church is gone, God will start the prophetic clock of the Jews ticking again. And now the prophecies of the Old Testament will be fulfilled in them. The fact is, the New Testament does not teach a radical separation of Jews and Gentiles. It teaches that they are both to be united in one. They are one Israel. There's no longer Jew nor Greek, the Apostle Paul says. Besides, there's only one tree, according to Romans chapter 11. By the way, Christ has only one body, according to the Apostle Paul. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. Here the Apostle Paul says, For by one Spirit... Are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and all have been made to drink into one spirit? How many bodies does Jesus have? He has one body, which is the Jewish nation, and he has another body, which is the Gentiles. Is that what the Apostle Paul teaches? No, he teaches that there is one body of Christ, composed of Jews and Gentiles, one plan for both, which is centered in Jesus Christ. Notice also Ephesians chapter five, 3, verses 5 and 6 on this same point. Here the Apostle Paul says, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And what, what is revealed? That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. Fellow heirs with whom? The with the Jews. And of the same what? Body. And of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. How many bodies does Jesus have? Two mutually separable bodies? No, he has one body and that is the body of Jesus Christ. Furthermore, the Apostle Paul now knows that the temple, the true temple of God, is not the literal temple in Jerusalem. Notice what we find in uh, Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 20 to 22 about Paul's understanding of what the temple is. You see, he used to think that the literal temple, that was it. <laughs> That's where God meets with his people. Now he discovers when he has his encounter with Jesus that the temple is a worldwide temple and that the temple is a spiritual temple. It actually represents the church. Notice Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 20 through 22. It says, and all and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. See, here's the foundations of the new temple. What, what are the foundations of the new temple? Literal stones? No. He says, upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief what? Cornerstone. What is the cornerstone of the new temple? Jesus. What are the foundations? The apostles and the prophets. And then notice, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. What are the stones that are built up in the temple? Upon the foundation. What are they? We are, right? Believers. So he says, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom, notice, ye also are builded together together 
for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Do you remember that in the Old Testament, who dwelt in the temple in the Old Testament? The Shekinah glory, right? Was the Shekinah glory located in one place? Yes, the Shekinah glory was in the sanctuary. But now the Apostle Paul says, no longer does God have a literal temple over in the Middle East. Because the temple is a spiritual temple. The foundations are spiritual, apostles and prophets. The chief cornerstone is a person, Jesus Christ. The stones of the temple represent the believers, and the Shekinah glory represents the Holy Spirit. For an habitation of God through the Spirit, it says here. So let me ask you, where is the Holy Spirit today? The Holy Spirit is everywhere, isn't He? He's present everywhere. So my question is this, where is the temple today? The temple is everywhere where there are two or three people gathered in the name of Jesus. In other words, the temple in the writings of the Apostle Paul is not a rebuilt Jerusalem temple. It is a spiritual temple composed of believers who have accepted Jesus Christ and whose faith is founded on the teachings of the apostles and the prophets. Let me ask you this then. What did the Apostle Paul mean when he said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3 that the Antichrist would sit in the temple of God showing himself to be God? Is he talking about a rebuilt Jerusalem temple where this nasty Antichrist, this little horn, this beast, this man of sin is going to sit during the last seven years of the history of the world and he's going to sit in this literal temple and he's going to blaspheme the name of Jesus and persecute the saints of the Most High? Is that the perspective of the Apostle Paul? No. For him, the temple is spiritual and worldwide. Therefore, the Antichrist must also be a spiritual and a worldwide system. Are you understanding my point? Someone who would try to usurp the place of Jesus Christ within the Christian church, which is symbolized by the temple. By the way, how long would the man of sin sit in the temple of God? Do you know that the Bible says that the Antichrist, 2 Thessalonians 2, which we're going to have a whole lecture on that later on, 2 Thessalonians 2 says that the Antichrist was already trying to surface in the days of the Apostle Paul. He says the mystery of iniquity already works. But that Antichrist power is not destroyed until the second coming of Jesus. So if the Antichrist power is trying to surface in the days of the Apostle Paul, but is not destroyed until Jesus comes, it must mean that the period of his dominion or the period of his rule cannot refer to literal three and a half years. Are you understanding? And it must mean that it's not a literal individual either. Do you know a literal individual that has lived from the days of Paul until today? Do you know anyone who has lived from the times of Paul, nasty individual, who will be destroyed when Jesus comes? I don't know of any, any individual, literal person, because what we're dealing with here is a worldwide what? A worldwide system where the Antichrist sits in the temple of God, which is the spiritual worldwide temple. By the way, do you know that many of these futurists teach that the sacrificial system will be reestablished once again, once the temple is rebuilt? That goes totally against the grain of the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 27 says this about the sacrifice of Jesus, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. There will be no more sacrifices because when Jesus died on the cross, all of the sacrifices came to an end when he said it is finished. That's why the veil of the temple was rent in two from top to bottom. God was saying the whole sacrificial system has come to an end. So how can you teach that during the millennium the sacrificial system will be established among the literal Jews? It's beyond my understanding. The Apostle Paul also realized that the important thing was no longer the so-called Holy Land in the Middle East. He realized that what God promised Abraham was not that little strip of land, which is such a bone of contention these days. He realized that God actually only gave that to Abraham, Abraham as a down payment that he was going to give him actually the whole world. <laughs> 
That's why in Romans chapter 4 and thir verse 13, it says that God promised Abraham that he would inherit the world. Furthermore, people speak about the importance of literal Jerusalem being that capital over there in the Middle East. Do you know that the book of Hebrews teaches clearly that the Jerusalem, the true Jerusalem today, is the heavenly Jerusalem? In fact, in Hebrews chapter 11 and verses 13 through 16, we're told that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob looked for a city. Not the one in the Middle East. They looked for a city, a heavenly city, whose builder and maker is whom? Is God. In fact, the Apostle Paul tells us in Philippians 3, 20 and 21 that our citizenship is where? Our citizenship is in the heavenly Jerusalem, not the earthly Jerusalem. The earthly Jerusalem has absolutely no prophetic significance or importance anymore because everything has shifted to heaven and has shifted spiritually to the church on a worldwide scale. By the way, do you know that the new Jerusalem we'll have people from both the Old and the New Testament because God, God is only going to have one city, not two. We are told in Revelation 21 that the foundations of the city have the names of the 12 apostles. But the gates of the city have the names of the 12 tribes. So there you have Old Testament saints and New Testament saints represented in the one heavenly city. Furthermore, if the temple is worldwide and Israel is worldwide, then Israel's enemies must also be spiritual and worldwide. Are you understanding what I'm saying? That's why the Apostle Paul says that we're not struggling against flesh and blood. We are struggling against principalities and against powers. You know the text, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, says that the enemies of Israel today are not literal enemies. It's not Russia. It's not the Arabs. It's not the Chinese who come from the east. The, the enemies of the church are not flesh and blood. They are principalities and powers of darkness in high places. Now, do you know who the, the nemesis of Israel was in the Old Testament? par excellence, it was Babylon. That literal city of Babylon over in Iraq where Saddam Hussein used to rule. But let me ask you, in the end time, is that going to be the enemy of God's people? Literal Babylon over there in Iraq? Do you know that some futurists teach that there has to be a reestablishment of Babylon over there in Iraq in order for Revelation to be fulfilled? The fact is, folks, that Revelation 17 tells us that this harlot, which is called Babylon, sits on many waters, which are multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples. In other words, the enemy of God's people, Babylon, the nemesis of Israel, is a worldwide system, which must mean that Israel and the temple must also be what? Must also be spiritual and worldwide. What are the weapons of God's Israel in this warfare? F-16s? Abram's tanks? No. In that same passage, in Ephesians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul says that we're supposed to garb ourselves with what? With the whole armor of God, which is a spiritual armor that spiritual Israel has. So that battle over the Middle East where they use tanks and F-16s has nothing to do with Bible prophecy because the warfare is a spiritual warfare against spiritual Israel with spiritual weapons. In fact, the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4 that the battle involves spiritual weapons and that we are supposed to be garbed with Jesus Christ in this warfare, in this battle. Allow me to mention that Jesus said that there's also only one Israel. He said in John chapter 10 and verse 16, he says, I have many sheep that are not of this fold. He's speaking about the, the Jewish nation. He says, I have many sheep that are not of this fold. I must also attract them. And when I attract them, there will be one fold and one shepherd. One Israel, in other words, not two, one. Furthermore, in Revelation chapter 12, only one woman represents all of Old Testament and New Testament Israel. Isn't that right? Revelation 12, you have this woman who has this child in her womb. Obviously, this is the Old Testament because the child hasn't been born yet. 
And then the child is born, and then the woman, the same woman, flees into the wilderness for 1,260 years. Let me ask you, the woman in the Old Testament, the woman in the New Testament, is it the same woman? Absolutely. That's why Jesus chose 12 apostles. Because he was trying to indicate that Israel was continuing, the 12 tribes of Israel of the Old Testament were continuing through the 12 apostles in the New Testament. In other words, Israel has a continuity. Are you understanding what I'm saying? That's why he chose 12. And if you don't think that he chose 12 purposely, when one of them fell and apostatized, which was Judas, the disciples got together and they said, we have to name a successor because there have to be 12 because this is God's true Israel. By the way, do you know that the redeemed will all sing a song that has Old Testament and New Testament characteristics? They will sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. No two Israels. Only one Israel. Only one tree. Only one body. Only one temple. Only one flock. One city that has characteristics of, of both Old and New Testament Israel. In fact, Jesus told Nicodemus the Jew, he says, you know, you think you're so great because you're a literal Jew. He says, unless you're born again, you're not going to see the kingdom of God and you're not going to enter the kingdom of God. Does that apply to the literal Jews today? Must they be converted if they expect to see the kingdom of God or enter the kingdom of God? Yes, it is conversion, having the same experience of Saul of Tarsus. Now as we draw this to a close, allow me to mention Galatians chapter 4. This is a very interesting chapter. We don't have time to read uh, all of the verses, but primarily verses 21 to 31. Here the Apostle Paul compares two women to two groups of people. He speaks of Hagar and he speaks of Sarah. And Hagar's son Ishmael and Sarah's son Isaac. Now let me ask you, the Jews of Christ's day, whose descendants would they be? They would be Isaac's descendants, right? Yes? Physically, Isaac descend Isaac's descendants? Yes. But do you know what the Apostle Paul says? The Apostle Paul says, the Jews of my day are descendants of Ishmael. Wow! He's calling the Jews of his day Arabs. You try doing that someday. You'll be sorry. He says, the Jerusalem that now is, is in bondage. Like Hagar was in bondage with her son. Said, the Jerusalem that now is, is in bondage. He says, but we who have accepted Jesus Christ are free. And he says, the old Jerusalem which is now is in bondage. He says, but our mother is the heavenly new Jerusalem. See, his focus has shifted from the literal to the spiritual. And by the way, Paul was not an outsider looking in. He was an insider. He was not anti-Semitic, because then he would be against himself. The Apostle Paul loved Israel. In fact, in Romans 9 he says, I wish I could be accursed if they could be saved. But he knew that they could not be saved merely by being literal Israel, by being physical descendants of Abraham. He knew that they had to receive Jesus as the Messiah, as he did, in order to see the kingdom of God and in order to be saved. The futuristic view of apostate Protestantism today commits the same mistake as Saul of Tarsus before his conversion. They jump from the Old Testament to the end time and totally bypass Jesus. They say that God chose literal Israel unconditionally and irrevocably and that all the promises of the Old Testament must be literally fulfilled with literally, literal Israel in the literal temple, in literal Jerusalem, with literal sacrifices, with a literal and local Antichrist sitting in a literal temple for a literal three and a half years. The literal enemies must come from the literal north, which is Russia, according to them, from the literal south, which are the Arabic nations, from the literal east, which is China, wielding literal weapons to wage a literal war against literal Jerusalem in the literal valley of Megiddo. Let me ask you, is that all false prophecy? Yes. It is false prophecy, because when prophecy does not focus on Jesus, it is false prophecy, because all prophecies must be focused on Jesus Christ.
Now the title of our presentation tonight is Israel and the Palestinians. Do you know that if the Jews and the Palestinians both accepted Jesus as their savior today, their hostilities would immediately cease? Because the Palestinians would say, who cares if I'm a Palestinian? It's not important. And the Jew would say, like Saul of Tarsus, what importance does it be to does it be uh, how important is it to be a literal Jew? We both accepted Jesus. Doesn't matter if I'm a Palestinian or an Arab or a Jew. We're, we're, we're united by Jesus. So what are we fighting about? The secret of true peace in the Middle East would be if the Arabs and the Jews both both accepted Jesus. Then they wouldn't fight anymore because the Arabs would realize that their ethnicity means nothing and the Jews would realize that their ethnicity means nothing. They would recognize that the only thing that counts is their connection with Jesus. They would be one in Jesus Christ. And of course, the treaties and all of the things that are being done to bring the Jews and the Arabs together are going to be in vain. Because until you deal with the heart, until you deal with bringing people to Jesus, that they might experience his peace and his joy and they might have a converted heart. Any treaty and any agreement is in vain because that human heart which it prides itself on its ethnicity, its language, its culture, its country immediately becomes rival of anyone who is different. Nothing short of conversion will do the trick. So folks, this futuristic system is a total system of false prophecy which bypasses Jesus, which directs people's eyes to the Middle East. Oh yes, prophecy is going to be fulfilled over there with literal Israel and a literal temple, a literal Antichrist ruling a literal three and a half years. That's where it's going to be fulfilled. And meanwhile, apostasy it runs rampant in the Christian church and the true Antichrist grows in Rome and the United States grows into being the Antichrist helper and no one can see it because they're looking in the wrong place. You see, the devil is a master of distraction. He's an expert at what you call a counterplay and I'll finish with this. You know what a counterplay is in football? Maybe a lot of you don't know much about football, but in football, you know, many times the linemen will pull one way and that gives the impression to the defensive linemen that the runner's coming that way. And so they all pull to the side where, where the offensive line pulls, but what they don't know is that the runner is going to sucker them into going around the other direction. In other words, it's a misdirection play and that's the way the devil works. He works by misdirection. He says, prophecy is being fulfilled over here. Everybody look over here. And then he runs around the end on the other side. And by the time people wake up, it's too late. These are things that we must share with people so that they can understand what the issues are in the great controversy. It has to do not with the oil of the Middle East. It has to do with your connection with Jesus. And folks, if we haven't received Jesus in our heart, we're not any better than the unbelieving Jews. So this is a call for all of, all of us to give our hearts to Jesus. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for being with us this evening. We thank you for the clarity of your holy word. We're thankful that you reached the Apostle Paul. What a champion he was. Lord, I ask that you will give us all the experience of Paul. That you will break our hearts. That you will break our selfishness that you will enter our lives and make us like Jesus, humble and lowly of heart. We thank you, Lord, for having been with us and for answering our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.